John Howard, it's such a privilege and a pleasure to sit next to you. So thank you for giving me a little bit of time. First of all, Tom Hughes, what kind of a man is he and why oh, are you honouring him? He's amazing. He's 100 not out. <laughs> and uh, he's one of my oldest and dearest friends in politics. I was his campaign director way back in 1963 when he was elected to the marginal seat of parks, which included Sydney suburbs like Earlwood and Canterbury and Campsy. And to place it in time, uh, the election took place a week after the assassination of President Kennedy. And um, you can imagine the impact that had on the campaign. But and he was a remarkable campaigner. He was a person who become a, a Queen's Counsel at the age of just under 40 and uh, he was a very talented barrister but he made a very good fist of politics. He ended up as an outstanding Attorney General and was unfairly sacked in my view from that position when um, Gorton was removed as Prime Minister and he played a major role in uh, personally arguing a, a big constitutional case about the corporation's power and uh, he made quite a mark. He is, I believe, the oldest surviving former cabinet minister any side of politics in Australia. Yeah, no, he's an incredible man. I, I had the, the joy of speaking to him earlier, and he's still sharp as a tack, oh, which sharp as a, tack. a lot and of people say about you as well. Oh, yeah, but I'm not as old as Tom, but, you know, I'm working on it. But Actually, speaking of age, and you, <laughs> you brought up US politics in some way, shape or form with the assassination. I'd love your thoughts on Trump and his bid to reclaim the White House and whether or not well, you think... I'm afraid I couldn't vote for Trump if I were an American. He didn't leave the field when the umpire's finger went up. And if you claim to be... A believer in democracy, you have to accept the verdict of the people. You don't like it. I didn't like losing the election to Kevin Rudd, and I'm quite sure Paul Keating didn't like losing the election to me, but we accepted it. I accepted it. And uh, you just have to. So that's unforgivable in your eyes? Well, uh, I don't regard myself as having the capacity ever to say what's forgivable and not forgivable but for a higher power than me, but... I think that if you are going to play the democratic game, you've got to play by the rules. And one of the rules is to accept when you've lost. And I thought the pressure he put on Vice President Hintz, who'd been a very decent man, was terrible. And uh, I'm glad I don't have a vote in that election because I, I think there are cognitive problems surrounding the Trump's likely opponent. I'd love your thoughts as well on the new CDF, uh, a Navy bloke. And I think the last CDF who was Navy was under your reign. <laughs> yes. Well, there's nothing wrong with having a Navy man. Um, uh, we've had wonderful CDFs. He's got a, a great career. And uh, we've had CDFs in the Army, such as Peter Cosgrove. And uh, we've had CDFs uh, from the Air Force, uh, Angus Houston. And the, the new chief of the Air Force is a chapel, so we've covered every base. <laughs> you have indeed. Uh, one of the things that you did so well in power was protect Australian borders. We've had three boatloads of people arrive recently. Are you worried that we're not secure in our borders at the moment under this Labor government? I always get worried because Labor has a bad track record. Um, we secured the borders... And when I lost office in 2007, Kevin Rudd said, oh, we'll keep the borders safe and we'll do this. But they thought they could have their cake and eat it. And uh, they mucked around and abolished things. And before long, uh, the immigration program was out of control. Now, I hope that we are not seeing the beginnings of that. But I do worry. I don't want to jump to conclusions. And it's for the government and the opposition of the day to argue the toss on what these arrivals mean but what is important is that you must never send ambiguous message messages to people smugglers they will pounce they will exploit they'll try and drive a wedge and i worry 
No, Dad used to tell me all the time about the messages that were used by these lowest scum of the earth people smugglers, and you're right, any even perception of weakness, they use and they are low. Well, you know from experience of somebody you were very close to, your dad, that just how challenging keeping our borders secure is, and it, it's essential to maintaining public support for a high immigration program. I believe in immigration. Immigration's helped this country enormously, and I believe in this country having the capacity to take refugees as part of the immigrant intake. You'll only maintain public support for that if the public thinks that the whole thing is being administered properly. You've got to get them on side, believe in why you're doing yeah, and, it. And once you look as though you're losing control, they start withdrawing their support, and I don't blame them. Um, John, looking at the situation at the moment, Israel, Gaza, Penny Wong made some comments today about recognising a Palestinian state. A lot of people have been very angry about that, saying that she's essentially rewarding terrorism. What's your thoughts on those statements and how the Australian government is handling this well, conflict? I think, I think this government, and Penny Wong in particular, has demonstrably failed to react in the right way uh, to the attack on Israel on the 7th of October last year. There were more Jews killed in that attack than in any incident since the Holocaust. And I am just staggered that the government didn't, from the get-go, say, whatever differences we have, we must never, ever sound as though uh, we don't care about the re-emergence of anti-Semitism. I mean, the, what was done to the Jewish people by the Nazis, the, most monstrous act of inhumanity in the whole of recorded history and I just don't think the government has been tough enough and firm enough and unambiguous enough. Now as for having a Palestinian state as well as um, uh, the state of Israel, the Arab world has never accepted Israel's right to exist. Way back in 1947 when the first president of the United Nations was Dr. Evatt, who was a Labor Party leader, uh, Israel was created with the sanction, the authority of the United Nations. And yet, through the years, various attempts have been made to have a two-state solution. I mean, of course, the Palestinian people are entitled to their legitimate aspirations. But I have yet to see clear evidence that the Arab world, the Palestinians and the Arab world in general will accept Israel's right to exist behind secure, defensible, internationally respected boundaries. And until that happens, it's just feeding aggression and terrorism to pretend otherwise. John, we're here at the Opera House. Um, part of this reason and part of the reason Julian and Lisa wanted to host this event here was to reclaim the Opera House because those images that went around the world, the celebration of the vicious, callous death of Jewish Israelis by Hamas chanted on the steps of this Opera House. Is tonight important to reclaim that back, even symbolically? Well, I think what happened outside the Opera House after the 7th of October brought shame on our country. I don't think it would have happened if from the very beginning a lead had been given. People react to leads and it's the role of a Prime Minister, it's the role of a government to give a lead and if from the very beginning it had been clearly stated as the policy of the Australian Government that no matter what our other differences are, one thing we will not tolerate is the re-emergence of any semblance of anti-Semitism. Isn't he just incredible? Wow.